morning, everyone. Welcome to the UCF Art Gallery. Glad you're all here today. It's great, right? This morning we're going to have a little discussion um, with the art faculty that we have here today. Shannon Lindsay, Deborah Starr, <laughs> and Brooks Deardor is here. And Carla Poindexter is here. Might be online. I don't know if Carla's here with us online or if she's So, um, I've got a couple, just a little brief little questions, um, and then we can also open up and, for questions and discussions about artwork in the faculty show today, um, just to see what people want to talk about. And just have an open discussion about artwork, just for fun. Awesome. Okay. So, I was going to open up with uh, Debbie. I noticed I was looking at your work, and uh, I noticed you used the word snapshot. I wanted to get your thoughts on snapshot and renaissance. I noticed those two words were used a lot during your In my past, yeah. I think that for me, as a student, I was really interested in renaissance, but not the Italian renaissance. I was very much interested in the northern renaissance from the Flemish, Belgian, Dutch kind of trend out of that kind of school, looking at the way that they handled their artwork. I also like the little bits of iconography that were in those paintings, so I was very interested in creating my own iconography. The um, snapshots are, I mean, I have done portraits in the past where someone just sat there and looked like the banker, you know, and it, it really did really give you a good feeling of catching that person. It was a, you got their image, but it didn't give you any personal insight to them. I like the idea of a snapshot because you catch it and you can work with that. You know? I think that it's, uh, for me, with a, when I'm painting portraits, I want to know about the sitter. I want to know about the person that's in the painting. And to give some information to the viewer rather than just a black suit. So yeah, lots of color and a uh, snapshot of how they look at that moment. In 10 years, they won't look like that anymore. So it gives them a good item to keep as a memory, but also as a decent painting to have in the house. I, I like the colorful kind of thing. I like more the approach where it's not just going to hang somewhere where people pass by, but to be for people that really relate to that painting. And I like that. Brooks, on your um, piece Malibu, it's a photograph but printed on metal this time, right? So it's on aluminum? It's a, it's a photograph mounted on aluminum. Uh, only what's called back on. Yeah. Okay. And um, I wanted to, your thoughts on using the jewelry or the metal bling that you've got on it. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so a lot, a lot of my practices uh, around uh, ideas about how we experience nature through photographs, the influence of like photography um, on our ideas of nature, kind of as a, as a broad umbrella of the things that I think about. And in this, this piece specifically, um, this was an image that uh, came from like a photojournalist uh, and that I appropriated and it was uh, photographing the fires, wildfires in Malibu. And um, I grew up in California, and Malibu was a place that, uh, for me, and I think just maybe culturally, is a, a, is a place where we associate with, with kind of wealth, wealth and excess. And um, I was interested in what was kind of embedded in this image, like this, uh, both this kind of like impending doom and natural disaster and idea about ideas about climate change that are kind of like very directly uh, in contrast to that kind of like wealth uh, that exists. And um, uh, I think that the, the goal change kind of began as this, uh, almost like as a, as a kind of formal exercise where I was interested in just the, the relationship of, because I think in, in many ways that image is, is kind of strangely beautiful and sublime. Um, but at the same time, that kind of belies this like uh, this sense of impending doom, right? Or like destruction. 
And um, I was thinking about how uh, these goal chains could kind of disrupt this vision, um, how the goal chains could relate to um, speaking to just like wealth, uh, wealth privilege uh, in relationship to environmental kind of destruction and decay. And um, that there isn't kind of in, in any kind of implied action, they're just sitting there existing, kind of being this declaration simultaneously with this like environmental destruction, which is like kind of what, uh, you know, I, I, I think seems to be happening um, like currently. And I think that it also, um, to me, I, I've, a lot of my work photographically is takes on these sculptural components for, um, in order to kind of disrupt that understanding of photograph like as a window view. I think that it's very easy within photography, especially now, to see photographs of like environmental this destruction and easily kind of flip through or pass by images like that because we've become so numb and accustomed. So it's thinking about kind of visual strategies that can be used that might um, that might disrupt that kind of like way that we understand images or the way that we so easily kind of flip through images. Um, and uh, just to give to give a viewer a different different experience of kind of like looking at seeing a photograph and feeling themselves like in relationship um, to an image.
grab you. I was going to ask you about the floating fish. Floating fish. The floating fish have several things going on. Uh, I lived in the Caribbean for over 35 years, so I spent a lot of time around fish and oceans. But the goldfish themselves came out of doing those old portraits of bankers. And you're talking to the mother working, the mother I'm working. So they did not stop talking. And so I, I, in my head, I used to envision, I'm just going to slap a fish on the side of his head. You know what I mean? Stop talking, trying to work. And um, so it became that every time someone changed their chain of thought while I'm working, they get a fish. So if they talk about the house, they talk about the kids, they talk now about their car, their job. And I would just make these little marks as to how many times they change the subject and they get a goldfish. The goldfish are called little dreamers, that's the type of fish that, that I was taking it from, and um, they're like little dreams, like wishes are part of the iconography that I work on. So there's always fish. Sometimes like you see with a child, there might be only four and they can talk about when can I get up, what can I eat, that kind of thing. So it's just little things like that. But you'll see adults, I might have 40 or 50 of them in there because they just really talk. Yeah. I would think they'd be opposite. Yeah. That's really yeah. it's, it's not, because they're like, it's the same question over and over again. Can I get up or can I have candy or can I have this, you know, like that. Where, where an adult will go on for everything from their past and whatever, so keep adding things. There's a lot of different iconography. So it's like, could they, peacock feathers mean something. If I do the painting and you see frogs in there, that means something different, you know? So like the, a frog, for example, would be, if it's a green frog, it means you told me something you really shouldn't have told me. <laughs> if, you told, if you get a little blue, dark poison frog in there, I mean, you told something that you should never tell anybody. So yeah, those are, you have to kind of look for these little clues. Did we hear all these, all the iconography is like, somehow a record of like the conversation that you had. Yes. Yeah. I have no idea. Yeah. So and certain fish, you know, like if, if there are certain things in there, like if there's uh, puffer fish or, or trigger fish and things like that, those mean things, you know what I mean? Different kinds of fish mean things. So for example, if somebody has a, a lot of baggage, they're gonna get those little puffer fish, you know, like they're gonna get all that information. So it goes in there to tell a little bit more about what went on between us as we're working, you know. So it gets a little, little storytelling. <laughs> Shannon, um, what's your reasoning behind the neon um, colors that you use? Yeah, so, um, you know, it's interesting the sort of color palette that's associated with a lot of these materials. In terms of how they're manufactured and one component that I have in here is actually using that security fence as a stencil so that's sort of that bottom layer that you can see like I laid over that security fence and spray painted it and I wanted to sort of make reference to some of those like that fencing material which you can actually get in these very bright neon colors they come in like bright orange or bright green or bright yellow and I thought in sort of playing with referencing the color as um, the material, the materiality aspect of it, instead of having it in its physical form, I'm sort of referencing the presence of it through the, it as a stencil, the sort of record of it being on the surface, but no longer there. And then I really enjoyed incorporating the neon color to make reference to um, the material as well. So. Yeah, so this was really a first time that I was um, bringing in those neon colors outside of the direct material itself. So it was definitely a new approach, and I'm excited about it. <laughs> um, so it's fun. So thanks for uh, pointing that out. Brooks, I was going to question you about the size, scale, and the shape. Yeah, um, I mean, I think most, maybe most obviously the the, uh, the shape. Um, I've been doing this recently in the past year or so, 
in kind of um, creating irregular shapes and not having frames. And I think it's part of a, a kind of like logic just within thinking about photography and thinking about an audience viewing photography, how we look at photographs, of not wanting to take anything for granted or not wanting a kind of viewer to, um, you know, re rely on old, old assumptions about how we look at photographs. So I think the, um, hopefully, as someone like approaches a, a work like that, like you just ask the obvious questions about like, you know, why isn't this, in a, why is it shaped like this? Why does it have this particular, uh, why does it have a frame? And I think the answers to those questions are like really important to me, right? The answers to the questions are like, um, it's, it's like, I think disrupting, uh, hopefully disrupting um, this, this uh, the, how we kind of like traditionally are accustomed to viewing photos so that if it, you, you become aware of yourself looking at this photograph, as opposed to just looking at a photograph for what the information that it provides. Um, and in a similar way, like the, the size, I think I think about that as well. These kind of like phenomenological experiences that you might have viewing um, this work in person, right? I think like a lot of the, a lot of the times like viewing a, viewing a photograph in person has been thought of as maybe not as important, right? It's like, why can't I just see this on a computer? What's the significance of having like, a photograph in person in a gallery versus just like seeing it on a screen anywhere, right? And that's an, that's an important question. And I think um, uh, a lot of the things that I do, including size and shape, is about kind of creating a relationship between the photograph and the person doing it, creating a, person, a relationship between that image, this piece, and like the person's body, right? I think like the scale is important, right? The scale is uh, uh, when you get close to it, kind of like a little bit more enveloping, has a relationship to like your body and and imagining maybe the weight or like the sharpness of like these, these cuts or these corners. And that creating a kind of like uh, physiological response in a viewer that is maybe uh, bodily or like more emotional as opposed to like intellectual or simultaneous like with the kind of intellectual experience which I think um, would be different from experiencing like a photograph online so it's a lot of those moves are kind of just like wanting to see how I can like disrupt a kind of person's relationship with an image or make them have a person think differently about it because I think because I think that's important, because I think um, uh, this, I think what, just like culturally in viewing the kind of whatever, millions and millions of images that we do all the time, um, kind of creates this kind of numbness, especially in relationship to like environmental themes or um, images of like climate change, you know? And um, thinking about how to uh, look at photos differently, I think, has real consequence. It's, I think maybe becoming numb to images also makes these kind of crises seem, uh, we become numb, numb to these crises or make them seem kind of like less important or able to be like passed easily and quickly. Um, and I think a lot of the, a lot of what I'm doing is, is seeing if we can change that kind of relationship. So I'm going to open this one up to all three of you. Um, what would you study as a side class if you were back in school, if you got a chance to, to test something different in your artwork? Pertaining to my artwork? Yeah. It wouldn't have to be art. It could be music, it could be anything like that. But Try to throw a curve into your work or test something new. What would you, what would you be interested in trying? I don't know that I would do that. For me, I'm older, so I mean, I've pretty much played with all of that stuff before. I 
As an undergrad, in the very beginning, I was very much in printmaking, and then I went from printmaking to ceramics. I did the ceramics for a while. I painted fruit with oils for about 32 years. Then when I came here, it was like no oil, now it's acrylic. Um, I've always been interested in archaeology, anthropology, that kind of thing, so I've always, I still read and touch at that all the time, so I'm always looking at that kind of work, too. And being, living in other countries has helped a lot, too, like looking at how other people perceive certain items and styles of art, that kind of thing. And I think I've, I've done plenty of that. You know, I think now, I mean, uh, this past event with COVID, I mean, not having access to models <laughs> and things like that, that was very difficult for me. Grandchildren are sort of when they see me with the paper, so like, oh, do I have to sit here now? Because it's like, sit, sit here, do this, do this. You know, so I think, uh, I think maybe subject matter might be different, you know, a little bit. I love painting people, I've always loved painting people, and I, and I still do, but I, I would play around with a little bit more than that, too. Uh, I, so for me, I would definitely dive fully into physics. Uh, so for me, you know, I, I create some two-dimensional works, but then I also do installations uh, that are site-specific. And, you know, a lot of the sort of physics components of those I'm really learning <laughs> on the job, right? Um, and there's so much of it that is so interesting and really informs how the work develops in the space. And so I would definitely... Uh, take some classes in physics and I'm also just in generally really interested in some of the sort of theoretical frameworks around physics and especially entropy and um, sort of how they create formulas and different ways to sort of express these ideas that are really difficult to explain and I'm sort of trying to navigate how we can visually represent some of these ideas and so um, but you know, also, you know, in my undergrad, I I considered pharmacy, so I did take chemistry, and I would probably take even more chemistry because there's a lot of interest um, in, to me in, in that combination. And then I guess outside of just my studio practice, just being an artist in general, I would take as many business classes that you can. Um, you know, the role of the artist and uh, our sort of professional activity has changed so much, even in the last 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, of what our sort of the, the sort of business entrepreneurial side of being an artist. And I think if, um, if I were to go back in time, I would be like a double major in business and communications probably. So um, yeah, that's what I would do. <laughs> Um, I feel like I would probably take more philosophy classes. Mm -hmm. Like I, I feel like I didn't get, I didn't take as much as I as I should have when I was an undergrad. I feel like that I, I got a good, um, I think, dose of, of of theory and learning philosophy through through kind of the framework of like um, art and theory when I was in graduate school. But I feel like to have those kind of like basic underpinnings of like. Um, you know, kind of very foundational fundamental philosophy would would be really helpful. Like I feel like learning learning what I have about philosophy, learning about theory when I was in graduate school, um, I feel like really just op opened up um, so many different ideas, so many different like like artists that I had known for years and not really understood. I feel like I now had to now had the capacity to like understand what they were trying to do in their work and it became more interesting and how I feel like how I saw the world became more interesting. Um, so I feel like I feel like I would say philosophy. Alright, so I think I'm gonna open it up to the audience now. If, uh, if you guys have any questions for us, please comment. Um, your work deals a lot with very extreme crises that you know, are kind of, we all have to deal with and the students are dealing with. Um, how, well, I guess it's a part, two part question. I mean, the impact that it has directly on you and your family in making the work, and then like, your highest hopes for the impact it has on the viewer, like what are the um, of, like, uh, 
would I affect the in, would I want for the impact of my artwork to be on people who see it? Yeah, yeah. So the first one would be like, how does it maybe how does making it or going through the process of making it help you or you know, or what are your kind of mental states working on it? Yeah. And then the on the opposite of it is what are your hopes for the view or that, you know. And finally if you can be able to capture their attention for all these strategies. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the, for your first, the first part of that question for me personally, um, I, I find it uh, a really valuable process. Uh, just me and my studio are looking on online, just like understanding that, you know, this, this, this image world is like pretty insane. You know, the amount of, of images that we see, the amount of information that we like are all receiving all the time. And part of the, Part of the practice, I think, is a is a process of because I'm appropriating pretty much all of my images. It's it's about I, I want to think very specifically about what are the kinds of images that we are seeing all the time and like how might that have an impact on us? Because I think that's that is an important thing to think about uh, personally. And so there's a there's a process that I go through myself of just. Um, of just like what's what am I seeing? Like what am I seeing on Instagram? What am I seeing on like news sites? Like what are these kinds of images that you see again and again and again? And what do they do to us? Um, and so for me to think about that, um, just on an individual level, I think is I, is helpful to be a little bit more self-aware about like what I'm seeing and how that might be affecting me and my views on the world. And I want, and it's it's a desire to like share that kind of self awareness. I think that goes into making the work that I do. Um, so maybe just on a really basic level, it's, there's like hope, hoping that people who look at my work are a bit more conscious about how they look at images, um, and maybe if I'm to be aspirational, just like thinking about how that, how then, that self-awareness about how we look at, especially these images of like climate change and environmental disasters, um, that we can do something instead of being numb to it, that we can think about, um, uh, you know, maybe more of uh, an active engagement, you know, like I think part of the, the desire to have imply the viewer like in looking at it in the gallery is like hopefully there becomes this more physical and active engagement like with one's individual body and then that that is a kind of generative way to kind of like mobilize uh, a different understanding but then also action uh, hopefully um, um, so and but on the very you know at and uh, hopefully it's, it's, it's about kind of like thinking about ideas, you know, thinking about um, ideas that then hopefully people can take action on. businesses and stuff like that that, I, that I've already done, that part has come out more in the classroom to help the student understand because I want them to understand when they leave, they do need to know how to do these things. You know, they do need to know how to set up paperwork and proposals and businesses, studios, that kind of thing. And I think that that part has come out more, like that's my experience coming into the classroom right now, but not changing so much my art practice itself. sharing the experience? I think for me, it's maybe a sort of accountability uh, in my own work that I really uh, try to stress to my students, right? Trying to stress, 
like, you know, really being direct and concise about what you're trying to visually communicate and how does that have an impact on a viewer and thinking about that experience, like Brooks is explaining, right, that like in-person experience and how that's different from just like scrolling on the screen, right? And so making sure that I sort of have that same accountability in my own work, right, and I'm, um, that I don't get too comfortable in, in doing the same thing over and over and, you know, really taking time to investigate that accountability and, and what I'm doing and why I'm, and why I'm doing it. You know, I talk a lot in class about your why, what, and how. And, uh, you know, so sort of always making sure I'm reflecting that on myself has been um, really impactful, right, in terms of that relationship of being an, an artist educator. Um, I, I feel like there's always an interesting conversation in photography just in how, like, uh, the way we experience Im images change all the time, and I feel like I learn from my students about, like, how they experience images. Like, I, I try to find out, I feel like I am, uh, I have a fine understanding of, like, Instagram and, like, social media and things like that, but my students are kind of like in the, very in the cut and know much more than me. But these are the places where we're like looking at lots and lots of images, right? And so what what kinds of images are they looking at and like how does that shape the, like how they view the world? Um, you know, I, we have, I had this discussion recently with like a student of mine that was talking about, uh, you know, these, these like Instagram photographers that have millions of followers but they're not visible like in the in the more official like art world and what is the difference between those um, and why is it like that um, and so I don't know it's, it's interesting I feel like it's interesting to hear from them about like what what they see Sometimes I could sit on the couch and I literally could just nod off on the chair. So you have to set times and say, okay, I'm going to do, like, this day is this day. I'm going to work on this, you know, you set up your times and stuff like that. But it, it, is, it is hard, I think, sometimes with that. And you, you want to do as much as you want to do work, you know. In the summer, I get a lot more time that's mine and I can do that. But it's very hard, like, if it's in the, getting to a final or getting to a midterm or something. Have to set up your own schedule, set up your own timelines for stuff. I've been, I feel like I've been thinking so much about this, especially having like a small child. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, but I feel like it's it's always a negotiation. I feel like it's individual to everyone. Um, but I, for me, what has what has been good is is to have a very specific like routine and to like value like studio time as much as like my official teaching job I feel like and that's not to that's not to say that I like um, 
sacrifice teaching for the studio, but that I have very clear distinctions when I'm going to dedicate the time to, like, time to the studio and to working, and to have that be like, I like think about that as I think about like times when I have to go to class and teach, you know, that these are um, things that like a habit and a routine that I do um, for this many hours a week or whatever. Um, that has been very helpful just not to, uh, to, to think about it as another kind of like job as opposed to I'll, I'll wait around until I get inspired because I feel like what ends up happening is that you have all kinds of other things to do, right? You, we have all kinds of other like, um, I got trains to play with, I got like <laughs> papers, to, papers to grade. Drawing on the Yeah, exactly. But, you know, having it, Having you thought of it, no, this is really important time too, and this is growth, and this will help um, me be a better teacher too. Um, being dedicated like that in the studio, but it's always it's always hard. Yeah, I think I think that that's really important, and you know, of course, like just structuring your time and what you can dedicate to it. And I really like what you said, like you don't just like wait for like creativity to strike you, right? Because I think for most of us, right, who are artists, educators, and maybe have different roles, maybe we're affiliated with organizations, you know, I have, you know, I have an administrative role here with the gallery. It's important for me to just sort of schedule that time to where, like, mentally I can go to that place, right? To where mentally I can sort of shut off, like, I know I need to grade, I know I need to do this, um, but I'm dedicating this time to where I can shift my mindset to where I'm able to work on my personal work, right? And so, for me, that's really important because, you know, like Brooke said, if you don't really make that time, then you don't really, for me, I would never get to that. I would never be productive. <laughs> because, you know, we are so passionate about all the other hats that we wear too, and we don't want to compromise any of that as well. But, you know, our practice as artists informs all of those things too. So it is a balance, right, sort of keeping, keeping that, but, yeah, for me, and also like just giving myself grace in the fact that, you know, if there's times where I wanted to carve out this amount of time for this week and something came up, like just giving yourself that flexibility and um, I think is important. And maybe sometimes you carved out, you know, this time on Friday night to work in the studio and you just mentally, you know, aren't there, right? Just, um, Allowing that, allowing that as a human, right? I think, you know, we can't always be on, like, sometimes shifting gears isn't always so easy also. So, um, that's what I try to do. <laughs> yeah. Great question. Can I ask a follow-up to that? Because I actually set up my next question. Um, there's a great book called Dream 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 Dream. Um, I would love to see it's like, my students, like, to make 10 new pieces you have to make up with your right? Yeah. Or something like that, right? How do you change the canvas. I'm, I already kind of have in my head what's going to be there, you know, so, but I think that takes a lot of practice to do that, you know. I I know that when I was younger, I would do, I would get on the canvas and start and I'd say, okay, now I'm going to just sort of fix this and change that, and I, because it was like a drawing process. I did a lot of drawing, you know, as a young person, but then I realized I could just do it with a paintbrush, so I'm just going to skip the pencil and go to there, so then, but I still have, those little um, bound copies of sketch pads, you know what I mean? That I just go in there and I make, like if I know this is what I'm working with, I'll make lots of little sketches for it first and then I'll kind of work it that way. To 
I'm not throwing it a lot of canvases away. <laughs> I'm just going to work right straight from there to there. Yeah. Um, I think I still follow that kind of model that you mentioned. Just like I, I try to make. I think the best work comes when I'm making a bunch and not too worried about it. Yeah. And then after the dust clears, I see what I have. Mm -hmm. Like that, that. I feel like that's when. That's when I feel the best. That's when I feel like my work is at, at the best. Is that kind of process? Um, um, and I, I feel like specifically, maybe for me in my practice, I also maybe I'm slightly different. Maybe not. But um, that I, I tend to think in terms of like a show, like or like a like a whole exhibition, and try to make a bunch of work around a theme or an idea and make as much as I can and I it's it's very like all the pieces are relational you know so it's like how can I form like the idea comes through all the, with all the pieces relating to each other in that space um, and so like uh, I think there's a lot of stuff that doesn't get shown um, because maybe I might think it's a nice piece or whatever, but it didn't necessarily fit within this like grouping that I thought best kind of like brought out this idea that I wanted to communicate with it this like show. Um, and I, I feel like that's how I tend to think in terms of like larger bodies or series. Um, but maybe on a more basic level, it's just like I try to I try to make as much as I can and then see where I end up. Yeah, I think I think my process is probably really similar, you know, to yours and thinking about, um, you know, and it, it's, it's sort of liberating for me because I really ground myself in the sort of history of process artists and really um, seeing the work as a record of my action in relationship to these materials. And I think uh, there's a lot of wiggle room in terms of how it's going to end up looking, right? Like the sort of final product. So I don't really have a final vision like prepared in my mind like that would be very close to your process right um so it's harder sometimes because i you know it's like this could be cool or this could be terrible uh so it's like really working on a lot of things at one time and you know like brooke said like when the dust settles you know go in with fresh eyes like well-rested fresh eyes and then and then things sort of start emerging right and it, it might be you know sort of visual relationships and you know, um, I like to make connections and materials. Uh, so again, sort of thinking about that, like exhibition, this sort of collection of works, and how how could how could a viewer sort of move from one to the next? And there's sort of this this little thread of communication that's happening visually through through either the forms or the materials or, or something like that. So. Um, yeah, it's definitely not easy, right? And sometimes you might go in and you're like, this is a complete failure. I I sort of try to never throw things away because, you know, depending on what happens in a week, two weeks, a month from now, I might go back to that and be like, okay, this is actually a great start to something different. Uh, so I think that that's also an important lesson is like, don't rely on your sort of immediate like reaction to your work in terms of it being a failure or a success. Sometimes I think something is really successful and then I go back in a couple weeks and I'm like, this is not there yet, right? Um, and that it, it changes. Um, so yeah, and you know, some pieces could go on forever. So you sort of have to have that that authorship in deciding when something is successful and done and then how it relates to the other work that it's, that it's around. So, yeah, it's um, not easy, but we make a lot of bad stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I got a question. That is called for your view. Um, what are your thoughts on the future of the art world and the impact of COVID and the move towards uh, the digitization of the of like a lot of the artwork is like happening now? Like NFTs? Yes, NFTs. <laughs> and just like a, how a lot of artists are starting to digitize their work and, mm -hmm. and you know, how COVID has affected that and affected the market in itself. 
I think you have like people that have always been putting stuff out there digitally for a long time to make a connection with outside. Like you said, I lived on the islands for a long time, so you need to be able to reach out and work that way sometimes, you know? I mean, like, I, I know when everybody was out working and I had several people come to me and go, oh, I can't work on Zoom, I can't do that. I was like, I've been doing that for years, you know? It wasn't Zoom, it was, you know, Skype, or before that it was something else. So to deal with that for well, a long time, so you could always be transmitting something like that. And whatever they're using now, like if they wanted to be Instagram or something like that, or you're going out to sites and building your own sites, you're still always going to put that work out there. I, I don't have a problem with that because if that was available 200 years ago, they would have been done, done it then too. So I don't have an issue with that. I think that that's the way most people get some coverage, you know, that they're getting a little bit of recognition. But if they're only working digitally, then that you know that has its own realm too. It has you know whether you're doing it to be character animations, films, and things like that, gaming. That works. That's a whole other field, but it's still there, you know, and it's still going to be there for a while. So I don't think it's going away. I think we might visual see it differently. It's great to be able to walk in and see it live because you want to get that feeling of being in front of it. We want that. So I think that they'll still. Be able to do that even if it's digitally and it was projected on the walls, you would still go, you know, to see it. Yeah. Uh, I guess personally, I actually think uh, artists are gonna have to be a little more intentional about, similar to the experience like Brooks is talking about, right? Like, how is the work different and intentional by seeing it in person, and how does that communicate? versus seeing it on a screen, right? And so I think for a, a long time, we sort of took for granted of, you know, sort of a digital representation of an artwork and just sort of accepting that as a record of it, but knowing that it exists in a different way when you see it physically. But now I think that this sort of opens opportunities that you can have an intention in both realms. You can have an intention with creating work that you really want to be shown in a strictly like digital platform versus work that you know is going to have a different impact you know in a physical space where people are going to see it in person so you know i think it's actually great and um, in terms of the market i think most people who have sort of inner workings with the market and actually jason burrell i, I think i've heard you talk about this before like when you go to art fairs and you have you know the gallerists who are talking to potential buyers you know they're pulling up their tablets and their computers to show them more images of those artists work and much of these sort of like galleries you know all of those transactions are happening based on digital imagery of work right so i don't think that that is a new thing um i think it maybe is just coming much more to light and, and artists are becoming more aware of it so i think the takeaway is take really good images of your work <laughs> because it's there's so much dependent on the digital representation of that even to get an opportunity to show your work in a physical space, 99% of the time that's gonna happen by sharing a digital representation of your work and it being juried or selected or whatever exactly. sort of formal process. So, yeah, and so it's like nothing really new. Right? The, only, the only thing that I've seen different over the years has been it's the same as somebody was writing a book. If you wrote a book, you had to go to a publisher and maybe he would publish your book. Right. Today, you can self-publish that book. Right. So the same with the art world, it was before you had to go to just a gallery. You, you can set up your own page, you can do things now that you couldn't do before. So I think that it spreads it wider, a wider mm -hmm. range. Um, I, yeah, I would probably just reiterate a lot of things that were already said. But I'm also, I feel like I'm, uh, I'm excited about a kind of like more democratic mm. kind of yeah. like sense of the art world. Like that's exciting to me to think about like, um, you know, looking looking at work from anywhere and anybody uh, in a, on an online platform that doesn't have to like uh, be dependent on like who you know mm -hmm. um, or how much money you have to like produce mm -hmm. like expensive work or whatever. Like, I think that there are, there's like opportunity that's created by a kind of like more democratic like uh, experience of like art. Um, but I also think, you know, that it also in turn, as, as maybe Shannon was mentioning, that it like, um, in, in the physical spaces, like it, 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 I think artists begin to think about, like that question of like, why does it, why does it need to be physical?
physical and this like art space. And I think you might maybe you see you, you begin to see like uh, more installation, more like experiential work, right? That is like like it's a really different experience if you show up and see this, with like much more impactful as opposed to like seeing documentation. Um, although like document obviously documentation is is really important at the same time, but it, I think it it does like drive a shift and like how artists think about like what to do in a physical space um, in, in, in relationship to like the internet and like images, people, the accessibility of like images, yeah. You can also bring the person, so seek out that live, you know, like except for me, I mean as a kid I remember seeing a book with a Ghent altarpiece in it and being fascinated by this work that had been there to where I needed to go there and see it physically myself, you know, so I think that that kind of works that way too. Thanks again. Thanks again for coming. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank, Thank you, Lady, for my